EdTech Mondays Africa is supported by the MasterCard Foundation Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning and is part of the MasterCard Foundation Young Africa Works programming. So let's do an experiment. Are you guys ready? Yes. So each one of you pick a balloon, your favorite colors, and you blow it. Cool. Now I want you to blow the balloon. All there in your lungs. And then let's blow the balloon. Let's blow. I think that's good enough. This? Yes. Corey, you know how to tie the balloon? No. Hi. I don't know. Can okay. I help? Teacher Rose yeah. will help you. So have you tied a knot? Tied. I'm tied. Have you tied? Can you hold your balloons like this? Do you have your balloons? Now we're going to make a balloon skewer. You know how to do that? Nah. Almost like mashkaki, but not a mashkaki, right? <laughs> okay. But it won't pop. So what happens if I was to poke the balloon on this side? What do you think will happen? Last. It'll bust. bust. So what are we going to do with our skewer? Where will we, we are going poke? to poke it here. On the middle, yes. So each one of you take a skewer and take make sure you're careful. It's it's good. Mm -hmm. And then can you see the skewer is sharp? Yeah. I'm I'm not. I am scared to. Poke. So let's poke <laughs> together then on this side. We we start like this way. Mm. Not poke. This. Okay. Poke. 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 Can I help you? Yes. Okay. Let's see. Can you see yours? Can you keep centered inside? It's centered. And here you go. Each one of you has a mishkaki. Clap for yourself. <laughs> Did you like this experiment? Good job. Yeah, we'll try again. Let's just remove this. Look, it doesn't even fit. What? So this experiment is simple. It shows round friction and shows also round molecules. So what happens with the balloon is like on this end and this end, the rubber is thickest. So when you poke on these two ends and the balloon would pop. Then. But if I was to poke on this side, since the balloon is most stretched, if I was to poke because it's the most stretched, then that means that the balloon would pop faster. And this theory just shows round um, when your car tire runs over a nail, so you don't remove it fast enough. You just let it stay around. The molecules of the rubber of the balloon will hold around the nail and then that means your your tire will probably deflate slower than it's supposed to or it will blow up. So that sort of thing. So if I was to poke it this way, which I won't, <laughs> it's going to burst. And as you can see, my balloon is smaller than it was when we began. Gamification uses role play or quizzes to make students more active rather than having them passively receive instruction as with traditional learning methods. And to gamify requires individuals or class-wide competitions that put students at the center of the learning process. Gamification turns the classroom into a large play area that increases the level of creativity in a setting familiar to many young people who also find comfort in such a learning process as we've just witnessed with the experiment there. And if gamification is to be used in education, we must better understand what it is, how it functions, and why it might be useful. Most of the gamification content requires one to have a device or a smart device just like this one. And we need to ask ourselves what infrastructure would teachers need to manage virtual classrooms? And so joining us in studio today, we've got Titi Adewusi, who is the co-founder and CEO of Niger Kids in Nigeria. We also have with us Kagisho Masai, who is the co-founder and CEO of Metric Live in South Africa. And joining us in studio, we've got Tracy Shiundu, who is the co-founder and CEO of Funky Science here in Kenya. And we also have a teacher with us, uh, that is Rosemary Bosibori uh, Onyancha, who is uh, a teacher of computer sciences at Moy Forces Academy in Lanet in Kenya. And we also do have the learners in studio with us. We've got five-year-old Kariyuki. Mm -hmm. And we also do have Corey, who is a nine-year-old learner. Thank you all for joining us. Let me start by finding out from us, especially our EdTech fellows, uh, Mastercard Foundation EdTech Fellows who are making the bigger part of our panelists on the show today. Um, Titi, let me start with you. What does Niger Kids do? Niger Kids is an online gamified platform where children can learn a lot of things. Uh, apart from math, English and science, they can also learn financial literacy. All they simply need is a device. They need, of course, internet uh, and to be able to subscribe and they can play games. So we have games, we have quizzes that teaches them financial literacy, teaches them digital literacy, science, math, English and science. It's really about fun learning. So 
you want to learn anything, you can learn it as a quiz, you can learn it as a game, and that's really what we're all about. Metric Live is a mobile application um, currently just catering for the South African curriculum. And what we've basically done is that we have socialized and gamified learning. Um, within our app, we have curriculum content where learners are able to engage with learning content. But the most important part, we have an e-game where the learners get to challenge each other on best of five quizzes, just like we used to in classes. And what they do as and when they play against each other, they end points. They take points from each other. There are leaderboards. There are win streaks. And then there's a very nice bragging element to it in which they are able to share the outcomes of each result with it. The byproduct is that they learn because their actual questions are based on their curriculum and their annual teaching plan. Right. And Tracy, uh, funky science, I mean. We make science simple. Mm -hmm. So we're making science fun and relatable to children. Mm -hmm. We're using uh, materials that are easily accessible to them. So balloons, water, baking soda, things that you easily find either in a supermarket or closer to you to demystify uh, science concepts, break them down, make it sound simpler. Uh, because even from the experiment I've shown, I've showed molecules and friction just by using a balloon and a skewer, things that, you know, we use every day, but we never ever think can actually help us describe a science concept or even help us learn. And that's what we like doing at Funky Science. Right, great. Um, and so, you know, we always talk about gamification and gamification in education. I mean, if you look at it traditionally, back in the day when we were asked to sing A to Z or sing 1 to 10, that was part of the gamification, right? It's just that now things are changing, learners are different, generations are different. Um, but what really is gamification? And from what um, Tracy just showed us, this is the off web based uh, gamification of learning. But from your understanding, TT and KG, how exactly are you implementing it in, in your applications and your solutions in EdTech? On our end, what we've done is that we've positioned ourselves as a supplementary learning platform. So we mm -hmm. are primarily on the phone and learners tend to spend most of their times on their phones after school. South Africa, for example, has a high cell phone penetration. And most of the time, learners are on their phones, be it on social media after hours. So what we have basically done is that we have made ourselves part of that attention. Um, our peak usage times are 8 p.m. to 2 a.m., right? But when you look at it, it's learners challenging each other. So we are leveraging their time and their attention. But it's very important. The design is important. You can't have a game and then it looks clunky. So we've prioritized how the interface looks, how it feels, having nice pop-ups and having like feel good elements. So that's how we leverage it. Reality is there are learning pieces and there are examining pieces. But for us is to say, in case you did not comprehend anything in class or you want to compete with your classmates later on at night, how about instead of spending it on the social media, spend it challenging each other to best of five quizzes on mathematics. We feel like that's a good outcome. Great. Uh, Titi, you want to share your thoughts as well? I think for us in Nigeria, what we've been able to do is provide an affordable online gamified platform. So affordability being the key word in the African context. And we've been able to do that by partnering with the telecoms of printers here. So like, you know, KG said, lots of people are, have their phones and spend a lot of time on their phone. So it means that, you know, for a, a very small amount, they can actually have access to lots of games. And we don't only focus on academic games, so math, English, and science, because we also realize some of the critical skills for the future. So a simple thing is like financial literacy is a big thing for us. So it means that your child can learn about money, they can learn about being an entrepreneur, but from playing a game, you can learn about earning, you know, and you have this game and they're washing dishes and they see that, you know, for the more dishes they wash, the more money they earn. And you see them trying to, you know, uh, you know, wash more dishes or do more house chores. And so what you're telling them there's sub two ways that, you know, the more you work, the more you earn. And then they realize that. Uh, or you can see a game whereby, you, you know, you're trying to, you know, count how many sweets that you can get. And you're learning about addition. So you're learning about, oh, two sweets or three sweets, and everybody wants more sweets, and they're learning addition. In the end, they are, they are amazed at what they learn, or they're playing a game on pizza, and it's about fractions. Uh, so for us, is how do we 
take anything that they are learning and just make it fun? How do we ensure that they have a, an affordable platform that they can go to to learn these things? And the, the more we they learn things that are not just math, English, and science, they're learning financial literacy, they're learning about online safety, and all this, you know, it's been, you know, done in a game. I remember that during COVID, we also taught a game about, you know, washing your hands and how to, you know, keep safe, you know, during the pandemic. So it's really all those things, learning anything really, but it's just fun. It's just something that you want to learn and you're learning it effortlessly. And that's really what right. we're all about. Uh, Rosemary, I want to come to you because, you know, just based on this alpha generation that just demonstrated to us uh, deflation or non-deflation of balloons, you can almost tell that generations are now changing, are different. Uh, back in the day, they would just tell us via textbook, how a balloon works when it's deflated or not deflated. But now you have an opportunity to turn that around and encourage young learners as well. But what has changed from your observation? What has changed both from the teaching side and the learning side as well? Nowadays, we are dealing with the 21st century students mm -hmm. and uh, they need uh, critical thinking, they need collaboration skills for them to be absorbed in the job market. During our days, we never used to experiment. We actually feared uh, to interact with the material. You, you, be t you will be taken to the lab and you don't want to interact with material. Right. So this generation is uh, uh, very uh, active and uh, they, very crit they use critical thinking, mm -hmm. uh, collaboration, and uh, communication skills. And uh, that is what is required in the job market. Well, yeah. interesting. Tracy, you know, when you came up with Funky Science, I'm yes. sure there was something behind it. And the thinking behind it leading to this experimental yes. or demo, live demo, uh, sort of work that you're currently doing now in schools. Do you want to tell us about it and how you think it's transforming uh, learning in Kenya? Yes, um, mm -hmm. so truthfully, Funky Science started off as we, we just enjoyed doing science experiments. And we used to go for festivals and different events and everyone used to look at them and say, wow, that looks like magic. And you know, for us, uh, for me, especially myself and my co-founder, we've done science-based courses. So we know it's not magic. We know it's a science uh, experiment that's happening or a science theorem that we're showing. Um, so we used to do these experiments and say, okay, you know, I think maybe we should show more people about these science experiments and just sort of break that barrier that is brought that science is magic and science is difficult and it's something I don't know or I don't understand. So we built onto that, just doing simple experiments with things that we find easily. And then now what we're doing, especially with the CBC curriculum, is we're now sort of complementing what's happening in the science courses in um, its grade seven, grade eight, grade nine, where they're doing now integrated science. Mm -hmm. And a lot of schools do not have access to labs, not have even the facilities to have a lab and that sort of thing. So we're trying to show the schools that, yes, you're teaching this concept, but you can, it's not a must that you have potassium permanganate and maybe hydrogen uh, chloride next to you. Mm -hmm. You can actually switch it up and use um, what we have now, like baking soda and vinegar, which are acid-based, and it shows the acid-based reaction and actually shows what happens. So the whole goal around it is to show that, yes, science happens all around us, but we can actually now try to simplify it so that even the learner does not feel disadvantaged because right. we know that. Quick question. How do you go about the approval of your content yes. and aligning with the fact that you just mentioned potassium Permanganate, uh, permanganate. Yeah. and and all the other chemicals, uh, chemical names that you know anyone can refer to in <laughs> physics or chemistry. How are you able to align this to the curriculum in Kenya? Okay, and also the content part, okay. getting it approved par the Kenyan standards. So what happens here regulatory? We have uh, Kenya KICD. Mm -hmm. So KICD are the ones who regulate what sort of content you're going in with to schools and what you're going to teach the students and they actually even curate what sort of content you're giving out. So we use the guides from KICD and then also around also getting accredited, it's also KICD that does the same for us. So what we do um, around teaching is that it's more complementing what the student learns. So if we are going to a school and setting it up, everything that we're doing is actually curated by whatever content is given out by KICD. So we use their, their content as a guide, especially for Kenyan curriculum schools. If it's a different curriculum, of course, it's governed by different things, but locally it's KCD. Great. Um, TT and KG, I want to hear your thoughts as well around content distribution and getting approvals. How have you gone about those areas, considering that, you know, we are working with different countries across the continent. There's, there's South Africa, there's Nigeria, there's Kenya. How are you able to 
correlate the content part with the approvals? To be honest, that's a difficult part, especially when you start to move from country to country. But here in Nigeria, like just like in Kenya, the curriculum is defined, whether it's for you know primary school, secondary school, um, um, you know higher higher secondary school. And so the first mm-hmm. thing really is to do whatever content you create, create it in line with the curriculum. The curriculum is published is you know on a website by the regulator that um, is in charge mm-hmm. of curriculum, which in Nigeria is LDC. So you, you you just need to ensure that, first of all, your content is in line with that. And then the next thing is also to start discussions with them. Because um, even as you move from school, some people are, you know, bigger on enforcement of the curriculum, some are not. But you know that as you are building your content, that needs to be world-class and there needs to meet the standard. It must always align with the, you know, the local, the local requirements. So that once you align with the curriculum and then you now start having that discussions with them, sometimes the discussions take pretty long, but sometimes, you know, uh, it's shorter and it can also vary from state to state. Even apart from right. the federal um, requirement, in each state, you still have to go and meet, you know, um, the state body to also have those discussions with them and allow them to go to the content. The truth is that once the federal body approves it, they're a bit more, uh, they're a bit more opened but you still need to have that initial discussion. So it's, sometimes it's really a long and tedious uh, process. But one of the things we've also found out is that apart from this, you know, the school, is the fact that there are a lot of other supplementary um, activities that happen. And then you also want to ensure that you're in those distribution um, channels as well. But I would say that for us, what has been something that has really helped has really helped the fact that you know we are um, doing the content along with um, in partnership with the telecom operators, which you know everybody yeah there's like three main telecom operators here in Nigeria, and so just having um, your content on their uh, platform makes distribution easier. But you still want to ensure that you're in line with all the other stakeholders, which government is a key stakeholder in, in, in most comes to education anywhere in the world. Yeah, similarly with us, I mean, it's through um, strategic partnerships. So fortunately, we have partnered with the National Education Collaboration Trust, which is um, almost an extension of the Department of Basic Education in South Africa. So what they do is that they give us updated study guides. And then what we then do is that we break everything down to align Mm -hmm. with that. So in South Africa as well, the annual teaching plan is published every year where you find certain sections um, added or removed. So every October to January, we have a huge deployment at Metric Lab where we've got content creators coming up, making sure that the content is updated and aligned with that. Over and above that, what we've done is that, for example, the big question library on which our game as well as our exam simulator is built on is actually based on six years worth of past papers. So it's not necessarily something that's for it. We've just taken it and broken it down over a tedious process and turned it into interactive games. Then beyond that, you have to partner with certain corporates. For example, we've partnered with one of the biggest financial service providers where we've integrated their gaming content on financial literacy in 11 official languages in the country. So that is approved by the Department of Basic Education and it has endorsements. So um, you always have to like leverage some of the big partnerships that are available around you. And so there's a question around... Um the engagement of the content that we are currently creating when we're speaking about gamification of content or gamification in education uh, the reason why certain um, ministries of education are not very receptive to especially web-based uh, gamification is because of the affordability aspect and uh, you know the fact that to access certain uh, content you need connectivity how do we go about connectivity and still being able to satisfy the needs of learners and the needs of educators, in this case, the learning institutions? The first thing that we did that is within our control. First things first, our application is completely free, right? Yeah. Um, we don't charge the end user and then we leverage business to business to customer kind of business model. So we make sure that the end users have it for free. That's the first part. From a connectivity perspective, that is one of the biggest challenges as well. You have to partner with telcos where there's limited um, partnerships. However, there are creative ways around it. For example, in South Africa, there is um, a a service provider called the Moya app. And what they basically do is that they do reverse billing for you. 
So what you are then able to do is that you can make your application and your game available on their platform where the, the learners are not charged uh, uh, any data and they can still engage with the content, although it may be limited. So, you know, there are challenges. Um, obviously, in the ideal part is that South Africa does relatively have good connectivity, but mm -hmm. there are remote parts. And in those remote parts, again, I'm a big proponent of partnership between private and public. So directly as the co-founder and a business leader in my business, I go straight to the corporates. I go straight to government and say, how can we get tablets in those regions? How can we get free data in those regions? And how can we deploy? It will take the big manual on the ground kind of part as well to kind of expand that reach. Okay, great. Um, just before I come to you, TT, I want to hear from Rosemary as well, who is uh, a user of content that's gamified uh, to a large extent, the web-based uh, content. How do you deal with issues around, one, understanding the content, implementing it as it should, and do you feel like you're able to engage the learners better compared to when we use traditional methods of teaching? Um, how are you able to keep learners in focus with all of this? Uh, we normally have lesson plan, and after planning, you have to see what materials are available. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have engaged with uh, web-based uh, gamification, like the Kahoot, mm -hmm. and I want to tell you that the students were engaged. And uh, what it does to the students, it uh, makes sure they're motivated, uh, they, they have good quality retention mm -hmm. so uh, basically that is what to do and as you're designing you you normally have a curriculum that you're working with you can't design anything outside uh, what uh, we, we don't have mm -hmm. so with that uh, then I, I am actually blessed to be in an institution where we can have access to the internet so that one makes it easier but uh, I am glad that uh, we have a solution uh, that is not web-based as well Right. So that means that the students are going to be uh, engaged. Uh, they are going to even evaluate themselves. And that is uh, basically learning. It's part of the learning yes, process. Yes, yes. Absolutely. Tracy, um, I know we're just about to go get into our next experiment, um, but your thoughts around uh, the content part and, and also the fact that you know, we, we need to make this as accessible as possible to even the underserved, yes. under-resourced uh, learners across the African continent. What are your suggestions in that? Um, so I think even KG touched on it a lot where mm. he mentioned partnerships. Mm -hmm. And I think that's key in terms of making our schools equal. Because we all know around the continent, schools are not equal in terms of resources, in terms of teachers, that sort of thing. So schools are not equal, yeah. classrooms are the same and that sort of thing. So I think the main thing that we need to do is partnership. So it's working together with government, working together with some of the startups that are doing ed tech solutions, working together with different funders around um, ASCAD Foundation, for example, um, different funders who actually fund different things within education, within the pipeline. It could be even funders who just fund internet for the school or mm -hmm. fund infrastructure, you know? They just come in and that, that's their position and then we build on from there. So like, let's say if we're bringing in infrastructure for, if we're bringing in materials for science experiments, then we come in and bring it in because education is a social good and i think we need to balance it out that everybody gets the same level so that if we work together as a unit then i think we'll also actually balance it out and then learners will get the same whether they're in cape town whether they're in Mandela. you know huh. it, it balances it all out great um so we're now ready for our next experiment do you want to take us through within inside the jars it's um vinegar but we've mm -hmm. colored it so that at least we don't think it's water and then boop, drink it up. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Safety. <laughs> so we've colored it and it's blue. So it's vinegar. And then KK and Corey, please lift your balloons up. If you look at the balloons, they have um, baking soda inside. Mm -hmm. So it's, we're showing an acid-based reaction. And um, of course, I alluded to it. So it's something simple and the, the children will do it. Mm -hmm. So KK and Corey... Um, take the mouths of your balloon and then maybe teacher Rosemary could also help Corey. Take the mouths of your balloon and flip them, put them over. So then what they're trying to demonstrate here is, an, is the reaction between an acid and a base to mm -hmm. create now a gas mm -hmm. and um, a liquid that will come at the bottom with a salt. <laughs> Let's Great. make that easier. So Great. we do the countdown. Five, four, four three, three, two, two one. one. Flip it over. Let it shake. Oh, wow. <laughs> and Corey, are you afraid it's gonna bust? Yeah. This is not going to pop. We said everything. And then if I was to remove this, 
So there's a gas inside yeah. the balloon. Yeah. Carbon dioxide. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And then inside, of course, is the fluid. Mm -hmm. that's so tell me about um, the outcome of these experiments. Do you feel that they're engaging for the kids? And do you feel like you're now encouraging them to get into science-based uh, subjects yeah, as a choice like of uh, uh -huh. pursuing uh, throughout the education process? Because we're seeing this is just at the foundational level. Yes, yes. Uh, take us through that part. So we actually started with when they're as young as possible, mm -hmm. because the reason is by then your mind has not been boggled with too many things. Yeah. So you've not also formed an opinion that science is difficult or science is hard that's why we try as much as possible to use also color because when you bring in color into the whole aspect it makes it more exciting right so what we've seen with some of our experiments it's not just that the child does the experiment from the funky science mm -hmm. lab or funky science session mm -hmm. but they go back to school and then they say oh yeah i remember we did this and i can explain everything word for word so that's what we've seen as we've gone through especially now i say with the kids the children who are in grade seven and grade eight they actually went through like our lab safety class and they wowed their teachers. So we, we, we actually seeing that we make an impact in that front. Well, and how yes. many learning institutions have you been able to so reach? Right now, right now we're working with, we, we're doing demos in different places, but mm -hmm. stagnantly we're working with two schools within the Nairobi metropolitan area. And then outside the county, we've worked with, um, I think there are 10 schools in Nyeri County just moving on and building on from that. Uh, are you able to estimate how many learners you've been able to impact? So from the beginning, from when we started, it was about 10K. But when we started this year, we've reached about 20,000 students across the country, actually across the continent, because we've also done online classes as well. Right. Can you say that these experiments can be done in any school, no matter how resourced or under-resourced they are? Yes, these experiments can be done in any school. Great. We're trying to cut across. All right. Um, and so, KG and uh, Titi, I want to come to you now. Um, but now, you know, when it, when it comes to gaming, you know, and I'm holding this device for a specific reason, that many a time we tend to lose our learners in the amount of time that they spend or the level of distraction that we have. While you might give them a specific piece of content to interact with, or learn from, it's so easy for them to veer off and get into every other, um, you know, other content outside of what, you know, you've purposed for them to have. And so how can we intersect learning and engagement without really bordering on distraction of learning, especially at the younger level, um, you know, with the ECD or early childhood development content that Frankie Science focuses on um, that is not web-based, we do have the parts that are web-based, especially for the K-12 and K-21 uh, learners as well. Um, Titi, what do you have to say around engagement versus not losing the learner in distraction? Before uh, a child starts using a device, as early as possible, we need to educate them about the internet, the use of the internet. And we need to ensure that they see all the internet. So yes, you know, children would always want fun. Who doesn't? And you need to introduce them to the things that are on the internet. So for instance, yeah. like what Tracy was, is that before they start forming opinions, or oh, the internet is evil, or oh, I'm very not, it's the various things they can learn in it, the various things they can use it for. So imagine if you tell your child, oh, you know, you can, fun. You can actually use it to create a video about what you do. So they're spending time on the device, but they're actually using it for something that is, is good and creative. So I think it's what's important is build a good part of it and how it's a useful tool. So imagine that you want to send uh, your auntie is fire away and say, you know what, why not create a wrap and then you know, use your phone to record it and send, send it to her. It can, it can be a science wrap, it can be a birthday wrap. So I, I think we need to um, show the various good things that are available on the internet. Even learning about documentaries, then about things were done. Tracy said some of their videos are online. Children love things that are fun. There are so many educational forms online. And you find children very off to things that they like and they enjoy. And I think we need to introduce a lot of those things to them early so that what they are spending their time on, even if they're not playing a, you know, something by Metric Life or something by Ninja Kids, they're listening to some fun science by Funky Science or they're doing something by Kunda Kids. There are so many expressions of fun that is educational, that is online that they can listen they can listen to music on youtube but it's you know so for me it's that introduce them to good and form part of learning before you make it seem as if it's evil all right rosemary do you agree with that 
Uh, sure, I agree with that. You know, the internet has a lot of knowledge that you can easily fall in love with mm -hmm. and go astray. But uh, for teachers, we have a responsibility of going into the internet and getting the content that is uh, uh, in line with the class. Mm -hmm. And then you can upload it in the learning management system. And with that, you can be able to get feedback from the students. And uh, that would be beautiful. I remember one time I decided to engage my students in, uh, in a group. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, they, they had to go to the internet to search. And then after that, they had to come up with new knowledge. The presentation of that knowledge should be uh, should have been in uh, in terms of uh, spoken word. You know that that is what the kids love to do, right. and it's fun. And actually, we had new knowledge, and uh, the students were excited. The, the lesson was quite short, and we were like, <laughs> "The lesson is over already." Like, where did the time? So, go? Uh, where did the time go? <laughs> it is right. very very engaging, interesting, and uh, motivating as well mm -hmm. and uh, the students who are competing and with the competition brings about good knowledge all right uh, brings about good knowledge I like that part but KG now over to you because you your content focuses mainly on the teenage um, learners and with teenage learners while the distraction might not be as high um, there's also other distractions outside of yeah. you know the the, the examinable content that they're trying to get on there. There's so much more that, that distract them from other applications as well that are accessed yeah. on, um, on the internet or web-based uh, content. How do you go about situations like these um, for you? Are you able to conduct workshops around uh, you know, getting them to understand the value? Are you able to do uh, school tours? How does it go for you to encourage them yeah. to really focus on the content? So, so far, the big part has been um, storytelling, right? Mm -hmm. I think one of the most beneficial situations about where we are is that the application went viral, but the story behind it is the fact that, like, from a development perspective, um, my business partner um, was given a laptop when he was 17 years old. And when he got a laptop, he went on the internet and started learning code on YouTube. And he learned mm -hmm. how to build games, you know, and, and, and what that storyline first thing highlights to people that are in the same age group is the good that is in the Internet. Oh, I can just learn code on, the, on YouTube and learn how to build a game. So from a brand positioning perspective, that has been very helpful. That's the one piece. The second piece, one thing that we have actually increased and intensified now is we have to leverage the teacher community. You know. Um, the thing is sometimes like technology is positioned as something as an alternative to teaching. No, it's a partner to the teacher. So when you bring teachers into the ecosystem and the teacher can tell the learners that go practice um, life sciences later on tonight on this section on metric life. Now, all of a sudden, it's part of you being led to the Internet, but for the beneficial aspects. Um, another part that we would like to do is actually having workshops. So part of our partnership, because we went viral during COVID when you couldn't really visit schools, but yeah. security has become heightened ever since we came back. It's exactly that. Leverage your partnerships, be it through yeah. Western Cape Education on our end or through the Department of Basic Education and the schools directly. Last week, Thursday, I was at a school talking to the metric learners, the 18-year-olds, telling them about the story of metric life as well as being responsible around leveraging what's online so a big part of it you know i wouldn't say there's a structured way but we try to make it a thread across schools the actual tech and our marketing elements to it as well i want to hear from you rosemary um as a teacher what do you think needs to be improved because usually you are consumers of content um, but how often do you get feedback or is feedback sourced from you, from developers like TT and KG and Tracy? Because usually they bring you a finished product, but have they consulted you as a teacher? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, they actually need to 
come to us when they are developing these solutions so that yes. we work together yeah. and it becomes easier to implement and even give them feedback. Uh, like uh, right now, this is uh, very interesting and uh, very informative, mm. uh, but uh, most, uh, most teachers don't have information about. Mm -hmm. So they need the capacity building. I have heard about workshops, that is very good. You start small and then it cascades down to all the other areas. Uh, that, that would be very, very useful and uh, it would be impactful as well. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the curriculum that we are dealing with is very much overloaded. So I want to believe the teachers are shying off from engaging in these activities because of the preparation that is required required. And uh, probably uh, in some areas, they don't have uh, the technology yeah. uh, to go and do research. And you, you, you see even uh, VR is very important, virtual reality, when it comes to learning concepts that are, are dangerous, like if uh, I'm to teach um, how to uh, fly a, a plane, uh, Practically, it's going to be very destructive. Mm -hmm. Even uh, the, the formation of uh, nitrogen oxide, that is a laughing gas. Yes. You can imagine all of us laughing here. So uh, if we can have uh, virtual labs, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, the, the, the teachers are capacity build about them, then that, that would be very useful. Great. Yeah. Um, so in, in conclusion, as we bring this conversation to a close, Tracy, I want to hear from you. And I know that uh, Funky Science focuses more on off web uh, yes. based or in this case, offline based uh, science uh, experiments. How do you intend to merge that with the content that's already happening, you know, web based content? Mm -hmm. Do you are you planning to have VR? incorporated into your content? Yes. How exactly are you planning to do that? But in mind, the under-resourced are learners as well. So we're really trying to figure out what else can we add on top mm -hmm. other than just doing the live sessions that children actually go on board and learn with us, but also trying to incorporate different things. Even we're trying to build even funky science AI. We're trying to think around what sort of questions would a child be asking? And then how can we gear that to make them think, okay, from I have maybe a balloon and I have a water bottle, what experiment can I do? So we're trying to think around that because mm -hmm. there are different things that can be done. And it's not just we are a cute way of recycling things, but it's also an interesting way for you to learn through that same recycling uh, sort of aspect. Great. Um, KG, over to you now. Um, in closing, what do you want our learners, our stakeholders, in this case, the government, the policy implementers, policy makers, policy reviewers, the entire ecosystem to understand about this new way of learning and how better can we make it for the learners who are experimenting this uh, from a younger age compared to those who are getting into it from, from, an, older, from an older age. No entity has all the answers. Yeah. You know, um, that's the one thing we just need to make peace with. No entity has all the answers, number one. Number two, um, we all have to play to our strengths. Um, we don't, we are not policy makers, neither are we educators, but we are pretty good product designers and developers, right? Mm. So um, if we are going to benefit this continent's education, we all need to come together and play each other to our strengths. Mm -hmm. Africa still has a lot of room for growth and experimentation, even in the most traditional of ways. And we must not write that off. You know, we have to consider the skill sets that are needed and the resources that we are working with. Um, so, I mean, I guess when I mention all of those elements, um, the theme is simple, collaboration and transparency. You know, um, that's that would be my message. Let us collaborate. Let us be transparent. Um, we also, as creators, need to go more to the educators, to the policymakers and say, what are your objectives? What do you need? How can I help? All right. So as we bring this to a close, let me hear from you in terms of uh, this conversation we've been having, gamification and its implementation. How best can we implement it on the African continent, uh, given all the factors at stake. You know, we have questions around policy implementation, policy review, 
But all of that really under consideration, how best do you think we can implement gamification in education in Africa as developers, as stakeholders, and also as the implementers of gamification? So we have a lot of solutions um, that a number of edtech companies have developed. How can we partner with corporates to take it to the schools and even beyond the schools? So how can we have this gamified content on various platforms? So for instance, if you're a major corporate and you're, you're a bank, you ha already have a website where people come to visit. Can the children come play things about financial literacy there? You know, of course, especially when you look at banks that have thousands of users that are children and teenagers. So for me, it's really partnership. Partnership is the way we can roll it out. Even, even partnership with government. So government wants to um, explain different things to children about taxes, about elections, about things. Why not put a game on your platform um, for the children that, you know, to learn that? And with organizations as well, you want to pass on information, why not gamify it? So I think the more it's part of every day, we already do it anyway. It's just that we're now, you know, partnering with a lot of companies to make it happen. So for me, let's partner. Let's, you know, let's make children learn effortlessly. Learning that is fun. Learning that is memorable. Just partner with, you know, a number of the edtech companies that are already doing awesome things in the space. That's that's what I would say. Um, Tracy, let me hear your thoughts on this one. Um, so interestingly, what we do at Funky Science is try, as much as our content, a lot of it is very offline. Mm -hmm. We incorporate some things that are online, where it's like the live videos that I mentioned, where we do a lot of experiments and also recording videos. But also the other things I think that can be done is just keep on working together. So when there are different events that we're having um, around just education, it just doesn't have to be specifically towards a specific theme. And maybe I can throw in, Titi has given me a lot of advice around having events for children and having those events and how I can run them together with different partners. Right. Because I think we get lost in, I want to run this my way, when you can run it with help from so many other people. Imagine, I never thought I'd get help from Nigeria to help me run a science event in Kenya. Right. So, you know, think of leveraging on those connections and those partnerships to grow it larger. And we might have more events, so even an Africa event now that we have all these partners from regionally, we could do this together. On gamification in, in education and, in Africa. Yeah. Right. Um, and speaking of, I think there's an edtech conference coming up. Uh, that's going to be in July. So make sure that yes. you're able to carry that knowledge as well uh, to the conference and share your thoughts around implementing basic education. But anyway, uh, coming to you, Rosemary, as a teacher and implementer of content, um, how better do you think the experience of gamification in education can be implemented? Because I do know that you also interact with other areas like robotics, um, and, and many other, you know, engaging learning content. How exactly do you think we need to implement this? This has been implemented on my side mm -hmm. uh, by basically engaging in after school programs. Yeah. Uh, when uh, schools close, we organize and even we volunteer on uh, activities uh, around tech challenge. We have uh, uh, like tech interactive where students collect various materials, uh, recyclable materials, and uh, they engage with that. Uh, they are given um, a challenge to come up with something, a, a product like uh, the, uh, the last year uh, challenge, they were supposed to come up with a glider. And it was very exciting uh, to actually use recyclable materials to come up with mm. uh, a glider that is going to deliver water because we had a, a theme that is smart water challenge uh, where uh, people don't have water. So it was supposed to deliver that. That was very exciting. And then uh, well, we also have clubs that we run that is coding, mm. uh, clubs where students interact with uh, uh, Scratch. They can come up with a game actually using the code. And uh, we are teaching our students to be uh, producers, not consumers. All right. And with that, uh, thank you all so much for joining us on this edition of EdTech Mondays. We've had Titi Adeosi, who is the co-founder and CEO of Niger Kids in Nigeria. We also had Kagisho Masai, who is the co-founder and COO of Metric Live in South Africa. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we had Tracy Shundu, co-founder and CEO of Funky Science in Kenya. And of course, Rosemary Onyancha Bosibori, who is a teacher of computer sciences 
at Moy Forces Academy in Lanet here in Kenya. And she's also the African Union Teacher of the Year. And I think that is really a great fit. Congratulations on that. And we Thank really you. are happy for you and thankful that you are able to come uh, joining us on the show today. We also had our little learners in the studio with us. Kariuki, who is a five-year-old learner, and Corey, who is a nine-year-old learner, taking us through the experiments here on EdTech Mondays. Thank you all so much for joining us. And until the next one, remember you can always email us on edtechmondays at mastercardfdm.org. Uh, and you can always uh, talk to us there and uh, send us all your feedback. For now, thank you for watching. Until the next one, bye-bye. EdTech Mondays Africa is supported by the MasterCard Foundation Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning and is part of the MasterCard Foundation Young Africa Works Programming.